Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this complete CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this section, we're going to focus on spanning tree, which is a layer two technology, which prevents loops across your layer two switched network. But before we get into that, I want to do a review of how network redundancy and our path selection and loop prevention works at layer three. And at layer three, routing and HSRP control the path selection and provide automatic failover for our layer three connections. You see the network topology diagram here. I'm gonna be using this throughout this section. And the routers up at the top, so R1, R2, SP1, and SP2 at the service providers, they've all got layer three connections between them. There's also a layer three connection going from R1 and R2 down to the end hosts, PC1 and PC2 at the bottom. But our switches, so CD1, the core distribution switch one, CD2, and our access layer switch access three and access four, they are layer two only switches. So this first lecture, we're gonna be talking about those layer three connections. So looking at the path selection, which is controlled by our routing. For this example, I'm just going to use static routes, but if we were using a dynamic routing protocol, it would work pretty much the same as this. So my first route on R1, I'm gonna have a default static route for all traffic going out to the internet, which points at SP1, my service provider router that is directly attached to R1. And the command I use is IP route 0.0.0.0, 0.0.0.0, 203.0.113.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
and whenever an interface is directly connected it goes into the routing table as a connected route with an administrative distance of zero so it will always be the preferred route to get to that network. I want to have redundancy to get down to my PCs in case the link going downstream to my CD1 switch goes down so for that I'm going to have a backup route pointing towards R2 again. My configuration there is IP route 10.10.10.0, and the next hop address on R2 of 10.10.20.2. This is a static route, so it has the default administrative distance of 1, which is not as good as the connected interface's AD of 0, so this will function as a backup route. Okay, so that was how I did my configuration on R1. R2 is going to have similar configuration as this as well. So I've got redundancy going northbound and southbound through my R1 and R2 routers. Now looking at things from the point of view of the PCs, they've got two gateways available on the 10.10.10.0 slash 24 network. There's R1 at 10.10.10.2 and there's R2 at 10.10.10.3. I want to have just one IP address to use as the default gateway on my PCs, so I'm going to configure HSRP on my R1 and R2 routers. This is configured at the interface level and it's interface gig 0 slash 1, which is facing down towards the PCs on both routers. So on R1, on interface gig 0 slash 1, I give it its physical IP address of 10.10.10.2, no shutdown, and then I say standby 1 IP, 10.10.10.1, that is the HSRP configuration that uses a virtual IP address of 10.10.10.1. On R2, I give it physical address 10.10.10.3, and it also has that shared virtual IP address of 10.10.10.1. I haven't configured priority and preemption for this example, so the highest IP address will default to being the active HSRP gateway. That is on R2 because it's 10.10.10.3. So all of the PCs will use R2 as their active default gateway. R1 is going to be the spare. If R2 or the link to R2 from CDTU goes down, then R1 will detect that and R1 will transition to being the active gateway. And now all our traffic going northbound from our PCs will go via R1. Okay, so that is how we configure our routing and our redundancy and failover when we've got redundant devices in a layer 3 network. Now it is possible that we could make a misconfiguration here and create a routing loop. So let's have a look at how that can happen. So here we've added a static route on R1 for 10.10.50.0 slash 24 with a next hop address of 203.0.113.1 on SP1. And then on SP1, we add an IP route also for the 10.10.50 network with a next hop address of 203.0.113.10 on SP2. SP2 routes it to R2 with IP address next hop 203.0.113.6 and on R2 we're routing traffic for 10.10.50.0 to R1 with the next hop address of 10.10.20.1. So you see we've created a layer 3 routing loop here. And what would happen would be if traffic gets sent into R1 or really any of these routers with an next hop address on the 10.10.50.0 network, it's going to start looping around those routers. But it's not going to loop forever because in the IP header, we've got the time to live field, the TTL. The way that the TTL works is every time that a packet passes through a router, it will decrement the TTL value by one. And if the TTL gets down to zero, the router will drop the traffic. So let's see how this fixes our loop. 
So a packet has come into R1 with a destination address of say 10.10.50.10 and it currently has a TTL of 5. So R1 will route it to SP1. It gets to SP1, SP1 will forward it to SP2 and it will decrement the TTL to 4. SP2 forwards it to R2, the TTL is decremented to 3. R2 sends it to R1, TTL goes to 2, and R1 will then send it back to SP1 and decrement the TTL to 1. When it comes into SP1, if it was going to forward it on again, it would decrement the TTL to 0, so it won't do that. It will drop the packet here, and it will send an ICMP time exceeded message back to R1 to let it know that the packet was dropped. Okay, so you've seen that it, layer 3, our standard layer 3 routing and HSRP will control the path selection and provide automatic failover for our layer 3 connections when we've got redundant devices. Dynamic routing protocols have built-in loop prevention mechanisms. So that example I showed you there where I deliberately created a routing loop with static routes, when you're using dynamic routing protocols, that shouldn't really be possible to happen because they've got built-in loop prevention mechanisms. But the TTL is there in the IP header to act as a final failsafe in case a loop does somehow get created. Okay, so that's how things work at layer three. In the next lecture, we'll start taking a look at how path selection, failover, and loop prevention is gonna work for our layer two only switches in our network example. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad free right now, then you can enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp by clicking the link above my head or in the description. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.